welcome to the Gordon Current Science and Technology stage. My name is Corrine, and today we're going to talk a little bit about how we can clean our water using nanotechnology. Now, to begin, I want to draw your attention to this cart. I have a tank here. I filled it up right outside the museum in Boston's own Charles River. And I'm wondering if I have any audience members who would be brave enough to drink this water. Anyone want to do that? Anyone? Really? You would want to drink this water? Do you know what's in it? So, how many people in here think it's a good idea to drink Charles River water? Any hands? Most of you guys know it's not. So, what if I told you, though, that this man drank water right out of the Charles. His name is Alan Cummings, and he's the CEO of a Vermont startup company that uses nanotechnology to clean water. And we challenged him to put his technology to the test, to use it to clean Charles River water and drink it right in front of us. And he did. And you can see he's just fine. Now, what do you think you would have to do in order to be comfortable drinking Charles River water? So what if I took this sieve here and I just kind of scooped up all the garbage off the top? Now would you be comfortable drinking it? Seeing a lot of shaking heads? Probably not. A lot of people rely on Brita filters at home. Do you guys think that a Brita filter would do a good enough job cleaning Charles River water? Seeing a lot of shaking heads? No. What about a chemical treatment like iodine or chlorine? Would you trust this to clean Charles River water to drink it? I'm still seeing a lot of shaking heads. A lot of people realize that these types of treatments probably wouldn't be sufficient to clean an urban polluted river like the Charles River that runs right through a very highly populated area. You know that all sorts of bad stuff ends up in the river. But what about a river like this? I like to camp up in New Hampshire and Vermont and I come across these crisp, clean mountain streams and I'm so tempted to just scoop up a handful and take a sip. Is that a good idea? No. What do you think? No, a lot of people saying no. Um, and you'd be right because even though we don't have to worry about chemical pollutants so much up in this area, uh, we don't know what's happening just upstream. For example, these animals aren't very careful about where they put their waste. And it turns out neither are these animals. And there are some nasty little things in animal waste that can make us very sick that we want to keep out of our water supply. What am I talking about? There are a whole bunch of different microbes that cause waterborne disease. This is one of them, this is Giardia. It's a tiny little protozoan parasite, but if it gets in your water supply and into your body, it makes you very sick. Diarrhea, nausea, cramps, it's really quite awful. We also have to be careful about bacteria in our water. This one's E. coli, but there is a lot of other ones that cause diseases like cholera and typhoid. We want to avoid those. And we also want to be careful for viruses, uh, rotavirus and hepatitis. All sorts of viruses could make us sick if they get in our water supply. And these microbes do make people very sick. Worldwide, about 2 million people every year die from waterborne diseases, and countless others are sickened. The tricky thing, though, is that these microbes are much too small to see. So you can't just tell by looking at your water whether or not it's safe to drink. Not to mention that chemical pollutants, while well, we're talking about molecules there, those are also much too small to see. So that brings us to this question. How can we be sure our water is safe to drink? How can we remove these tiny microbes and, and chemicals that are much too small to see? Now the answer to that question depends on who you are and where you live. Now most of us, we don't need to worry about that. The water that's delivered to your home is safe. All the microbes and chemicals have been removed from it, and usually it's treated at a large-scale water treatment plant. The water here at the museum comes from the Cambridge Water Department, and this is how Cambridge water is treated. It starts about 50 miles west of here, out in the Hobbs Brook Reservoir. And then it travels through a bunch of pipes before it arrives at Cambridge in Fresh Pond. Here's Fresh Pond, and right on the banks, you can see our water treatment plant. Now, the Cambridge water treatment plant does a few things to the water. The first thing it does is it adds a chemical coagulant. What that means is it just creates clumps of impurities. It bubbles up air through that water. So we have floating imp impurities that we can just skim right off the top. 
Now the next thing they do is they add ozone bubbles. Ozone is a molecule that has three oxygen atoms and it is very toxic to microbes. It kills bacteria, viruses, and protozoa. The next thing they do is they put it through a great big activated carbon filter. You can think about it a little bit like an enormous Brita filter. And then the last step, they add two more chemicals to disinfect the water, chlorine and chloramine. Now these chemicals kill microbes, and even though we've already done that in the water treatment plant, these chemicals are important to add because they stay in your water and they keep those microbes out of your water as it travels the miles of underground pipe till it gets to your home. Now that's very typical of a large-scale water treatment plant. The problem though is that all of these large-scale water treatment plants all require a lot of energy, money, infrastructure, and skilled engineers and laborers. Now we're lucky enough to have access to that here, but there are places in this world that don't. And there are situations that we might find ourselves in where we can't rely on treated water. Can someone give me an example? Maybe someone's traveled to a place where you couldn't rely on the drinking water. You had to purify it in some other way. Haiti, that's a very good example. There are a lot of developing countries that struggle with their water supply for a couple of different reasons. The first is that some areas are actually too poor or remote to have access to centralized water treatment. Another problem they may have is in very populated areas that their population is growing at such a rate they actually can't keep up with demand, that they can't build the water treatment plants or lay pipe fast enough to meet this growing need for fresh water. So that's something that a lot of developing countries struggle with. Another thing that actually everywhere in the world struggles with is right after a disaster, like Hurricane Katrina or the quakes we had in Haiti and Japan. Right after a big disaster, utilities shut down. You don't have power, you don't have clean water. So what do you do? Now, the final situation I wanna bring up is the fact that our infrastructure is old. In some cases, the pipes that bring water to your house were put underground more than a century ago. Those old pipes, they sometimes break, they have problems, and sometimes you'll end up with a water main break. That means that the water supply has been compromised and it's unsafe, and last year in Boston, we had a huge boil water order that a lot of communities had to boil their water before drinking it for a few days until the problem was fixed. And these problems will likely continue in the future because we're not replacing our pipes as fast as we need to. So figuring out how we can provide fresh, clean water in situations where we can't rely on large-scale water treatment is a big concern. In these cases, what should we do? Well, the easiest thing we can do is to cart in bottled water. It's convenient, it's portable. I can have clean, safe drinking water just about anywhere. The problem though is aside from the fact that the production, transportation, and disposal of these bottles is an environmental nightmare in and of itself, water's really heavy. Think about how much water you use every day. In this area, per capita water use is 50 gallons per person per day. This is a five gallon water jug. That means each person uses 10 of these every single day for cooking and cleaning and bathing and watering your lawn and uh, all that stuff. So that really adds up. That would weigh 400 pounds, 400 pounds of water per person. That becomes really difficult to move around. So transporting water isn't very feasible either. So that's why there are researchers that are looking for solutions. How could we purify our water simply, easily, on the spot, right where we want to use it? Now I'm going to tell you the story of three different people that are trying to do that. And the common thread between these people is that all three of them use nanotechnology to clean their water. So the first story is Michael Pritchard. He's an engineer and inventor in the UK. And about six years ago, he was sitting on his couch watching TV and he was watching the aftermath of the tsunami in Southeast Asia. And a few months after that, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And he noticed that there were these people surrounded by water and not a drop of it was safe to drink. And he thought it's so difficult to get fresh, clean water to these people in disaster situations. And he was inspired to do something about it. He created the Lifesaver bottle. It's a very simple device. All you have to do is unscrew the bottom, and then you take some water, any old dirty water you can find, pour it in the bottom of the bottle. Then when I screw the lid back on, I just pump this handle a few times, and then what comes out the other end is sterile, fresh drinking water. 
It's perfectly safe to drink. It's been purified and cleaned. And this is a really simple device, easy to use, that you could have fresh drinking water anywhere you needed it from any old source. Now, it's a great technology, um, and the way it works is similar in some ways to the regular water filters we use, but there's one important difference that I'm going to talk about. So all water filters are just membranes that have holes. You can think about it a little bit like a kitchen sieve, where you pour water through, water gets through the holes, but the membrane traps everything else. Now obviously a water filter has much smaller holes because we're trying to keep out these microbes that are too small to see. So I want to talk about the microbes for a minute. I have little models of a bacteria and a virus. And if you think about bacteria and viruses as little teeny tiny versions of this, you would be wrong because bacteria and viruses are really not that similar. It turns out bacteria are much, much bigger than viruses. If I was to take a bacteria and blow it up to be the size of an entire human being, it would be, uh, by comparison, a virus would be smaller than that. Actually, it would be more like this little guy. Bacteria are hundreds of times bigger than viruses. Now that's important to know when we're trying to filter uh, bacteria and viruses out of our water. Because most um, water filters, as we can think about them, like this kitchen sieve as a model, this cup represents dirty water. I have orange beads that represent great big bacteria, and those tiny little green beads represent viruses. When I pour dirty water through a water filter, the water flows through, and it traps a whole bunch of the microbes, all the bacteria, but those tiny little viruses were able to fall right through the membrane into the water. That's really what's tricky. And the Lifesaver bottle, though, has holes that are much smaller. They're only 15 nanometers in size. That's thousands of times thinner than the width of a single human hair, and it's smaller than our smallest viruses. So if I think about, by comparison to a regular water filter, the Lifesaver filter is more like this kitchen sieve in comparison. Much smaller holes. When I take another cup of my simulated dirty water, and I pour it into my other filter, you can see that nothing gets through. All the microbes, bacteria, and even the tiny viruses are trapped by the Lifesaver filter. So it's a really unique technology that solves the big problem, making sure that all the microbes are removed from our water. But it does have a shortcoming. The smaller I make my holes, the harder it is to push water through. You need more and more pressure and energy. And the second problem is the holes themselves don't remove any dissolved chemicals. You need something else as part of your filter to do that. So that brings us to our next technology. This is Alan Cummings, the man you saw at the beginning of the presentation, using the Selden water stick. Mr. Cummings works at Selden Technologies, and they've created a couple water filters. The picture you see here is the water stick's big brother, the water box. Now, what's interesting about their technology is they didn't invent it to provide water to people in disaster situations. They actually designed it for outer space. One of the biggest hurdles to manned space flight is bringing enough water for the astronauts to use when they're traveling in space. Water is very, very heavy, so they don't want to bring that much of it. So NASA asked people to create small, portable water filters uh, that don't require much power and would let the astronauts reuse or recycle the water on the spacecraft. And that's where the uh, Selden water stick was born. And Stephanie Wilson is one of the astronauts that helped test the prototype devices when she was up in space. Their filter depends on a material called a nano mesh. And that picture on the left is a microscope image of their nano mesh. And what's special about the nano mesh is the way it's woven, it actually has much bigger holes than the Lifesaver bottle. So water can flow through pretty easily but they're still able to keep out those teeny tiny microbes because of a special material that they put in that filter. They put carbon nanotubes. This is a gigantic model of a carbon nanotube. They're long skinny tubes made entirely of carbon. Um, this model just shows you the shape and structure, but the real carbon nanotubes are about 100 million times smaller than this one, very, very tiny. As I said, thousands of times thinner than the width of single human hairs. They're very small. But what's special about carbon nanotubes, or any carbon in general, is that pollutants, chemicals, and microbes like to adsorb or stick to the outside of carbon. So here I have these foam pieces. These represent pollutants, uh, microbes, and chemicals I might find in my water. When they flow through the filter, they come into contact with the carbon, and they stick to the outside. 
they attach to it, or as chem uh, chemists and scientists say, they adsorb to it. So um, there are these tiny tubes of carbon, because they're so small, they have a lot of surface area, lots of surfaces for those chemicals and uh, microbes to uh, come into contact with the carbon. And the way we can weave that mesh really lets, as the water flows through, all of those, those contaminants to come in contact with the carbon. And it's very effective at removing everything that we want to from the water. So I can demonstrate the water stick for you. I have some polluted water right over here. I have a glass to catch the clean stuff. All I have to do is pump this bulb a few times to send water through the water stick. You can see I'm catching clean water on the other side. And it is perfectly safe to drink. <sighs> Delicious. So that's another technology where we're using nanotechnology to purify our water in some new ways. The problem though with both these filters, and actually the problem with any water filter out there, whether or not it uses nanotechnology, is that we have a problem called filter fouling. That means when you use your filter to clean water, the stuff that you're removing from it can actually clog your filter. In uh, some cases, the microbes can start growing on your filter, which is pretty gross when you think about it. Um, and it doesn't become effective at cleaning your water anymore. So you need to clean and replace your filter on a pretty regular basis. So wouldn't it be great to have a self-cleaning filter? One nanotech researcher had an idea about how to do that. This is Chad Vesitas. He's a young researcher just up the road at Harvard University. And he had an idea about how to improve carbon nanotube filters. So that picture on the right is a microscope image of his filter. And you can see that it actually really closely resembles the one that we saw from Selden Technologies. But what he's doing is he's taking advantage of another property of carbon nanotubes. They are very good at conducting electricity. So what we can do with this carbon nanotube filter, he hooks it up to a small power source. It doesn't have to be powerful. It can be just a few AA batteries. But once you electrify your filter, you're doing something fancy called electrochemistry. Now all that means though, is the electricity that's running through your filter, when the stuff gets trapped in your filter, those microbes and chemicals, they get broken down, degraded or in inactivated by the electricity. So as a result, your filter stays clean for longer. You don't need to clean it or replace it nearly as often. So this is a really innovative uh, technology. It's still in the research phases. Um, so it's not commercially available like these other filters are. But hopefully we're going to see it develop and it's going to have an impact in the next few years. Uh, what's special about this one is it won't just help small water filters. It could be scaled up and really help any water filtration system out there. So it's very promising. In closing, um, I want to leave you with a few thoughts that I've just shared a few stories of real people that are using science and engineering skills to solve a real world problem. But something that I want you to think about right now is what you can do to conserve water. Just because we have as much clean water delivered to our homes as we like doesn't mean we can be wasteful with it. Our world in general is running out of fresh clean water for its growing population and we should conserve it whenever we can. Think about what you use, three gallons per minute of water that you spend in the shower. There are 40 gallons of water used with every load of laundry, 15 gallons every time you use your dishwasher. Running your garden hose, nine gallons of water per minute. So please take a moment and think about how you can conserve water. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Please come on up after the presentation. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day here at the museum. Thank you very much.